Vietnam has authorized weapons use in the South China Sea. Rand Corporation's Scott Harrell joins me to discuss if Hanoi has what it takes to go up against China. What are the human rights issues facing Malaysia? Human Rights Watch's Phil Robertson explains. Plus, bloggers in Bangladesh continue to fear death and more this week. Hello everyone, Steve Miller here on this beautiful Friday, September 18th, 2015. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's go ahead and get started with our very first story, once more, from the South China Sea. It's no secret that tensions in the South China Sea run high. While the most vocal critic of Beijing's behavior tends to be the Philippines, with the United States slowly stepping up its disapproval, the nation that really butted heads the most over the past year is Vietnam. If you recall, last year China moved in the Haiyang Shi Yao 981 oil rig into Vietnam's Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. China supported this action with a massive fleet of over 100 vessels. Vietnam tried to repel the platform by sending its Coast Guard, but to no avail. Chinese vessels bumped and ground, forcing them back. If Vietnamese fishing vessels made the mistake of challenging China, the results were sometimes catastrophic. Now Vietnam looks to avoid a similar situation and has authorized its Coast Guard to use weapons to chase away foreign vessels entering the country's waters illegally. This new order is set to take effect on October 20th. To dive into the ramifications, I recently spoke with Scott Harold. Deputy Director of the RAND Corporation's Center for Asia-Pacific Policy. I began our conversation by asking for clarification on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea provision that allows for passage through EEZs and how it relates to the South China Sea Code of Conduct. It depends on the exact wording, and I haven't seen the exact wording, but I have seen the news reporting on this. And it seemed to suggest that what Vietnam was authorizing its Coast Guard to do was to use force against vessels that enter into Vietnamese territorial waters. Now, the territorial waters of any country are sovereign waters and can be policed by the country as they fit. Most countries would uh, seek to use less than lethal force, and I suspect even the Vietnamese don't fire first and then ask questions. Um, but as we have seen in even this week, uh, there have been a number of incidents recently uh, where Vietnamese fishermen have been fired upon in Vietnamese waters. Uh, and in fact, that just happened early this week uh, off the southwest coast of Vietnam near the border with Cambodia. An unidentified vessel uh, took shots at uh, and, and actually killed a Vietnamese fisherman uh, while on his own boat. Uh, so I think that this is an issue inside of Vietnam. And of course, knowing uh, as you do very well, the situation in Vietnam where a, a communist party is also on the hook uh, to prove its nationalist credentials, just like in China, um, the, the notion that you are going to kind of take it on the chin and, and not respond that could be a very risky proposition if you're looking to maintain those nationalist credentials. So I think the government in Vietnam which has, of course, been put under much more substantial pressure than the government in China as a consequence of neighbors using force against to enforce their claims over and against uh, your claims. The government in Vietnam may therefore feel itself to be under some substantial pressure and therefore may be pushing to send a signal, deterrent or even, uh, you know, in the case of having to execute such threats uh, towards its neighbors to say, look, these are Vietnamese waters. Um, we're not looking to fire first, but we're not looking to allow you to uh, basically steal our uh, maritime protein fish and other kinds of uh, wildlife caught at sea, and we're going to defend them. Is it commensurate with unclosed? It, it would not be commensurate with uh, the exclusive economic zone, I think, because uh, countries are at least um, you know, advised to um, treat those as areas where other vessels are allowed to transit. They're not allowed to take the resources out. So if it was a policing issue in that sense, uh, I suppose it would be commensurate with UNCLOS. But in terms of the, um, the ASEAN-China declaration of uh, parties to the conflict over the South China Sea, their countries uh, were enjoined to uh, de-escalate and to not take any provocative actions. Uh, and so in this case, if the Vietnamese were doing anything that was highly provocative, 
which would not normally be seen in the form of, uh, you know, a police action by a Coast Guard, uh, unless it was something particularly egregious. Uh, then it, if, the Chi- if the Vietnamese did do something that was particularly egregious, I suppose you could argue that it was not commensurate with the, um, the DOC. Uh, the Declaration of Conduct, however, uh, has been most egregiously violated by the Chinese repeatedly with their artificial island construction, which is now leading to the emplacement of um, military facilities in the deepest reaches of the South China Sea and the Spratlys. Well, let's talk about China, because last year they did move that oil rig into Vietnamese waters. China claims most of the South China Sea as their sovereign territory, which does overlap with other countries. And a lot of people have said that this Vietnamese issuance of this order is in response to last year's conflict. But if you're going to issue an order to use force, you have to also be willing to back it up. And it's one thing to go against a small vessel that's firing upon a fishing vessel. But does Vietnam have what it takes to actually follow through if China goes into what it deems is its sovereign territory? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think the reality is um, that even with countries as mismatched in size and capabilities as China and Vietnam, uh, it's never the case that you can prejudge the outcome of a potential conflict in advance, even though the Vietnamese would look on paper to be seriously overmatched. We all know that Vietnam uh, has basically Uh, striven to free itself from Chinese hegemony and Chinese domination uh, is the overriding theme in Vietnamese history. Uh, The Vietnamese fought the Chinese to basically a standstill in 1979, uh, and people fight wars because they don't know the outcome. They think they will know the outcome, but they can't know for sure, and the other side doesn't agree. Moreover, there is an element of raising the costs to anyone in this, which has a deterrent aspect to it, right? So if the Vietnamese essentially signal that, hey, we're ready to use force if you, the Chinese, or any other country come back and try and take by force what is ours, um, it then forces the other side to reevaluate and say, you know, are we really willing to escalate to that level? Are we willing to fire upon them? Are we willing to be fired upon? And if you look at what the Vietnamese did last summer when the Chinese emplaced that Haiyang Shiyo 981 drilling platform, that semi-submersible drilling platform in the northern reaches of the South China Sea that was in waters that Vietnam claimed, the Vietnamese contested that very vigorously for a period of four weeks, five weeks, something like that. Well, yeah, like, like a month. Uh, like, like a month. Yeah. And you know, they, yeah. they sent their own Coast Guard vessels out there. There's bumping between ships. Several uh, fishing right. vessels also sunk. And, and the Vietnamese showed that despite China's superior size and military capabilities, they were not willing to simply allow this to happen. Uh, and they made China pay a very substantial price in a number of ways. First, in the global media, uh, this was a hot story for the, period of the, for the duration of that period. Uh, the visuals coming out were very deleterious to China's image. It showed Chinese vessels basically running down small, lightly armed or, or even unarmed Vietnamese vessels. Uh, so there was a reputational price to be paid. Moreover, there was an actual physical challenge, right? China actually had to field a sufficient number of vessels to keep that semi-submersible rig defended against Vietnamese maritime police forces. And that's quite costly because each of those vessels has to be staffed, has to be put to sea, has to be maintained. Uh, The operating costs were quite substantial. And so the Vietnamese, by showing that they would not simply accept what China had had done, uh, forced China to pay a more substantial cost. Now, if you were to say, in addition to us being willing to contest this position, as the Vietnamese have been willing to say in the past, now we're going to do so and we're going to do it in a way that authorizes us to use force, Um, now the Chinese have to, it basically forces them to factor in another wild card. Okay, maybe the Vietnamese will stand up, but maybe they're going to fire on us. So now we have to up armor all of our vessels. We have to be prepared to explain to our people why we put them at risk. We have to be prepared to explain to our nation and the families of those members who are serving on Chinese vessels, if anyone is killed, why why their lives were lost. so I think it has a substantial cost potentially for, for China if, if the Vietnamese are aiming first and foremost at China. But bear in mind, as I said earlier this week, uh, there was an unnamed national boat 
uh, that or a boat of unnamed national origin uh, to Vietnam's southwest that fired on these Vietnamese fishermen. Uh, that could be a Cambodian boat. There are um, occasionally spats between Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, the current uh, and long-standing uh, Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen is seen to be very favorable towards Vietnam since his government had its origins in the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in 1978-79. Uh, but there is a, a widespread um, frustration in Cambodia with the Vietnamese uh, and so Vietnam could be sending signals to multiple audiences with this announcement. There is more to that conversation, and you'll be able to find that on our website this weekend in the Asia Now podcast feed. What I'd like to know from you is this. Do you think Vietnam has the will to push back against China, and will this lead to armed skirmishes? As someone who has traveled extensively around Southeast Asia, if someone asks me about Malaysia, the first thing that comes to mind are the giant silver twin spires that are the Petronas Towers. Then I dive into fond memories of sitting on plastic stools, getting my fill of Penang's famous street food. But for many, Malaysia is a controversial location rife with human rights abuses. This week, I spoke with Phil Robertson, Human Rights Watch's Deputy Director for Asia. I started our conversation by asking him to paint a picture of what are some of the issues facing Malaysia today. Well, uh, there's a couple key parts that need to be understood. Uh, there's sort of the political sphere, and then there's the economic sphere, and of course they're connected. The political sphere really right now is revolving around the fight uh, by Prime Minister Najib to survive a major a corruption crisis, where it's been alleged by the Wall Street Journal and others that he received as much as 700 million U.S. dollars in his private bank accounts. Uh, it's believed to have come from a thing called 1MDB, the One Malaysia Development Berhad. And he has now been fighting tooth and nail uh, against critics, both within the government and his own party, as well as the opposition and, and civil society against those charges. And he has been using uh, draconian laws such as the Sedition Act or 124B of the Penal Code, which talks about uh, acts detrimental to parliamentary democracy, to try to intimidate critics. Connected to this, of course, is also a declining uh, economic situation for Malaysia. The uh, Malaysian ringgit is weaker than it's been in, in a decade. Uh, it's fallen to below four when it used to, used to be three. Uh, there's concerns about uh, inward investment. It is, like many countries, a export-oriented uh, uh, development model that uh, is, is there, and they, they are the focused on you know, the competitiveness issue. But connected to competitiveness is also uh, issues of government finances, and government finances are a big situ problem now. There was so much spending around the 2013 election and promises made uh, to try to win votes that the major budget deficit in Malaysia is now being felt, and the government brought in a highly unpopular general service tax uh, that was implemented earlier this year, and this has also really put the squeeze on people's cost of living. So. It's a very, very turbulent political atmosphere, uh, a government uh, led by a political party, UMNO, uh, that has been in power since independence in 1957, and a prime minister who, under threat, is now lashing out in critics using uh, draconian rights-abusing laws. And what about some of these laws? I mean, you mentioned the Sedition Act, but there's others that really stifle free speech and what citizens can do. Yes, certainly. There are the Sedition Act. Uh, there's also restrictions on public assembly through the Police Act. So we have a number of people who are being called up for not giving the police adequate notice, 10-day uh, notice uh, for holding a protest. We have uh, connections of the uh, restrictions on uh, printing and publishing documents. Uh, the guy who just won uh, the, the CPJ, a Committee to Protect Journalists Award, uh, a cartoonist uh, named uh, Zunar, is facing nine sedition charges for tweets that he sent out back in February after the federal court 
ruled that uh, Anwar Ibrahim, the opposition leader, was guilty of sodomy and, and sent him to prison for five years. I mean, these are the sort of uh, restrictions on freedom of expression and the media that we're seeing increasingly come forward. And now there's a proposal by the the media and multi, uh, the media and multi excuse me by the communications and multimedia minister uh, to require the registration of online news portals. It's very interesting. the 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 government controls the the actual printed press, uh, either through parties or directly through uh, government institutions. And, and but the the when you look at the online press, it's much more free, and, and most people are getting information from the Internet. And so that is something that the government is unhappy about. They're trying to stuff the Internet genie back into the bottle and try to, once again, reassert control over what their citizens are able to uh, read and hear. Well, well, speaking about the criminalization, I mean, did the ju- government just... Uh really charge a number of individuals for actions and protests that took place some six months ago? Well, that's right. We had the Kitalawan protest. This was a protest connected to the imprisonment of Anwar Ibrahim, the opposition leader for sodomy, and people demanding that uh, those charge, that, that, that conviction be vacated and that he be released. Uh, the government claimed that those people didn't provide necessary notice to the police in advance, and so they're charging him with, uh, uh, with the, the, that actual charge as well as uh, issues related to uh, what they said at the rallies. Uh, this is the same group of people that were also involved in organizing the highly successful Bercy 4 protests at the end of August. And we don't think it's a coincidence that uh, they have been brought up on charges for a previous protest uh, when the government is so unhappy about what they were doing at the end of August, where you had over 300,000 people gather in the center of KL, many of them demanding the resignation of Najib uh, and uh, respect for uh, democracy, human rights, and uh, non-corrupt governance. Well, let's turn that discussion to looking forward. I mean, you've already had to revise what you thought in the past about where Malaysia is today. And Human Rights Watch is conducting that research in the report that will be released next month. Uh, where do you see Malaysia going? Well, unfortunately, because of the ongoing political troubles of the prime minister, I think it's going to continue to go downwards on human rights. It's quite clear that Prime Minister Najib is prepared to sacrifice respect for human rights in, uh, for his political survival. And, you know, the larger question is what is going to happen within the ruling party? I mean, as I mentioned, there is a debate going on. There are factions for and against Najib. There's a lot of concern that if he led them into the next election, which is expected in 2018, that UMNO could suffer historic losses because of the uh, widespread perception that this is a corrupt government. Uh, it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen next. I think that you know, there's a sort of almost a, a, a catharsis going on now uh, about uh, the rule of a political party that has been associated with the government every step of the way since independence and whether there would be change that would happen there. And if the change takes place, then other associated issues, because, of course, it is a uh, multiracial, multiethnic country. And uh, that is always the sort of boogeyman that is brought out by the government that, you know, we're the only ones that can keep this all in order. And if, if we don't, then, you know, the Malays and the Indians and the Chinese will, will fight amongst themselves and it could lead to potential violence. I'm not sure that's the case. I think that, you know, Malaysia is much more politically mature than it was back in 1969 when there were riots. But this is still the, the thing that the government constantly pulls back uh, and places in front of the international and the national audiences that, you know, we're the only ones who can maintain order. And no one wants to see Malaysia uh, go down the road of a failed state. And, in fact, Prime Minister Najib during National Day was talking about that. He was saying that I will not let Malaysia be a failed state. And the fact that we're actually using those kind of terminology for Malaysia, I think, is uh, shocking to anybody who's followed the country for a while. All right, Phil Robertson is the Deputy Director for the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Thank you so much for your time this week. Thank you very much. There, of course, is more to our conversation, and you'll be able to find that on our website this weekend, the Asia Now podcast feed. 
On this particular subject, I'd love to hear from you. Do you pay any mind to the state of human rights abroad, or must there be a personal connection to you before it becomes real? Bangladesh is undergoing a crisis of free speech. This year, four secular bloggers have been brutally murdered. First, they took place at night, then in broad daylight, and now the latest inside a blogger's home. Robert A. Lindsay of the U.S.-based Center for Inquiry criticized the government in a statement, quote, What was already a human rights crisis has now spun entirely out of control and is now long overdue for the government of Bangladesh to take seriously its moral responsibility to protect the lives of its people. But this problem goes deeper than just Bangladesh. The world can no longer sit by and allow this global crackdown on free expression by both terror groups and states alike to continue. The rights to free expression and dissent must be protected and cherished, and these killings must be stopped now. End quote. Police then announced a week later that five men had been arrested for their alleged involvement in three of the four murders, all are tied to the banned Islamic extremist group Ansarullah Bangla team, and one of those arrested has dual citizenship with the United Kingdom and may have information on all four crimes. Even with the arrests, critics of the government and police feel the investigations are too slow. Some bloggers have actually stopped writing altogether in order to protect themselves. Quote, I would do anything but disclose my address and phone number to the police now. I believe if I do, the information will be leaked to the Islamists in no time, said blogger Sakil Ahmed. Now that seems extreme, but given that at least one blogger has been murdered while using a pen name and made no public mention of his address, leads some to conclude the police are leaking information. Only law enforcement agencies have the technologies to uncover the real identity of an online activist using a pen name and his location, said a blogger. Now, the blogging community says it feels directly threatened by Bangladesh's prime minister, who has said that bloggers in the country would be not allowed to hurt the religious sentiments of others. Ibrahim Kahil, a blogger who lives in hiding due to repeated death threats, said, quote, the Prime Minister is indirectly asking the free thinkers to leave the country. Her second message is, if they do not leave the country, they would be killed by militants or become victims of police torture. I guess very soon the bloggers will start facing persecution by police in Bangladesh. The government has failed to stop the killings of the bloggers, but it has now joined the militants in an attempt to take away the citizens' right to the freedom of expression. End quote. And the bloggers may be right. Prime Minister Hasina's warning signals that some of the bloggers could soon be detained under Section 57 of Bangladesh's Information and Communication Technology Act and face up to 14 years in jail and fines up to 128,000 U.S. dollars for publishing false images and information and disrupting the law and order situation of the country. Social activist and Dhaka University professor Mabubul Mokadem Akash postulated this. Who will decide whether a piece of writing is aimed at maligning someone or it is a part of historical discourse? Who will judge if someone writing will be within his right to freedom of thought or is attacking others with some false accusations unfairly? To decide such a case related to Section 57 of the Act, one has to be in an intellectual war, he warned. Human Rights Watch's Mumbai-based South Asia director, Minakshi Ganguly, said, quote, it's clear the Prime Minister has presided over an era of rights abuses and intolerance in Bangladesh. The shocking rights crimes like these killings of bloggers is just one part of an overall worsening picture. When are Bangladesh's donors going to stand up and say enough is enough and demand that this government get serious about protecting human rights? End quote. Michael Dodora, also from the Center for Inquiry, called the situation a crisis and that it qualified as an emergency. Quote, these militants already terrorize and kill with impunity, and the Prime Minister's admonitions of secularist writers only serve to embolden the killers. Religious ideas do not need the government of Bangladesh to protect them, but its people do. Badly. End quote. Which really does beg the question, what's so threatening about an atheist? Empathy. 
China's top diplomat, State Councilor Yang Jiechi, dropped this little gem last week. Quote, China and the United States actually can make cybersecurity a point of cooperation between our two countries. We hope China, the United States, and other countries could work together to work out the rules for cybersecurity in the international arena in the spirit of mutual respect, equality, and mutual benefit. End quote. In a statement released over this past weekend, the White House said U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice had a frank and open exchange about cyber issues in her meeting with Meng Zhenzhou, Secretary of the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission of the Chinese Communist Party. All of this comes as Chinese President Xi Jinping prepares for his U.S. visit in a few weeks and as the Obama administration considers targeted sanctions against individuals and companies that perpetrated commercial and federal cyber attacks, the results of which were seen recently at China's massive Victory Parade. The Victory Parade was a bazaar of stolen intellectual property, said Michael Raska, senior fellow at the Singapore-based Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies, and he said it was possible to identify components and designs in different equipment which have been sourced from other countries in a dubious manner. Citing a specific example, Raska said that the Chinese HQ-6A launchers were based conceptually on the cloned Italian Elena Espide missile, which in turn was based on the U.S. RIM-7 E and F Sparrow. He went on to say that China's J-15 naval fighter was based on an adaption of a Russian aircraft. So what to make of Young's remark? Well, they're hollow. They're for show. They mean absolutely nothing. We see that not only with the nature of the state-sponsored attack on the Office of Personnel Management, which is easily the most catastrophic data breach in U.S. history because of the sensitive nature of the data, but also with the continued intellectual property theft Chinese agents engage in. Some have taken up the charge for the U.S. to appoint a data security czar or to view the incursions by China and other nations like North Korea as an act of war. However, as Rand Corporation's Martin Lebicki pointed out in the June 19, 2015 Asia Now podcast, just about every nation conducts some sort of cyber espionage program, and most states draw a line between corporate and government-level data breaches. And that's great, but it doesn't answer the question as to what to do about it or how really to eliminate the threat. Assuredly, better safeguards do need to be put in place to protect data, but at the rate technology is developed, about the only true way to eliminate the threat of a data breach is to get rid of the electronics involved and go back to pen and paper. There will always be someone better out there to steal your data. The United States and other nations will forever be in a cycle of developing cyber defenses only to have them breached. That's simply the way things are. The challenge is to stay just ahead of the curve so you don't get caught with your pants down. The other piece to this is how to respond to attacks. On the corporate side, there are legal avenues in place, but let's get real. If you're trying to seek reparations from a nation or a company based in China, good luck. Over on the state side of things, the nature of retaliation poses an interesting dilemma. A nation can't simply sit back and take an incursion, but what kind of response would be acceptable? How proportional is proportional? If one treats a hack like the Sony Pictures infiltration or the OPM data mining hack as an act of cyber war, what does it mean for the parties involved? That is what countries are still struggling to find out. Yes, we do see some measured responses, like the United States disrupting North Korean infrastructure for a few days, but that's about it. The reality is that those conducting hacks are seeing just how far they can push the other side in a game of brinkmanship, causing disruption, but not damage. In essence, cyber attacks can generally be thought of as the cost of doing business. As soon as one state initiates a cyber attack that actually causes widespread financial disruption or failure in a critical infrastructure system, that will be the day governments treat cyber attacks the same way they treat physical attacks and the responses will be just as severe. Which does pose a very real threat that the situation could spiral into a full-on digital conflict that could potentially create a far greater chaos than we imagine. It's time once more for the Friday edition of the Asia Brief, featuring stories from the region you may have missed. 
we're going to kick things off with an update on the dengue fever outbreak in both Taiwan and India. I noted on a recent episode of the Asia Brief that things are quickly getting out of hand in Taiwan, especially in the city of Tiananmen. Since our last report, the number of confirmed dengue cases has risen to nearly 10,500 and could be on pace to hit 20,000 by the end of the year. Taiwan has also confirmed that 25 people have died from dengue hemorrhagic fever, significantly more than in the same period of last year. 2014 saw the most cases of dengue in Taiwan, but those topped out at just under 16,000 in previous years Outbreaks peaked in October, and hopefully, that trend will continue. Please keep in mind that while dengue is a potentially fatal disease, the outbreak is largely isolated to the city of Tiananmen, where almost 90% of the cases have been reported. In India, New Delhi is battling its worst case of dengue outbreak in five years. Delhi's chief minister, Arvind Kerriwal, threatened to cancel the licenses of private hospitals if they deny admission to patients suffering from dengue fever, following a report that one hospital turned away two boys who later died. So many people have dengue in India. There are reports the number of hospital beds aren't sufficient, forcing some patients to share. Health experts say that the dengue outbreak has exposed the inadequacy of public health measures in India. The number of hospital beds, for example, has not kept pace with the country's rising population. A Mumbai court has convicted 12 men, holding them responsible for a series of deadly bomb blasts that ripped through trains nearly a decade ago, the result of which caused the deaths of 188 people and wounded over 800. Judge Yatin D. Shinde levied the guilty verdict last week for 12 of the 13 men who were on trial at a special court for the July 2006 blasts. The 13th individual was acquitted. They had been charged with murder, conspiracy, and waging war against the nation. While Mumbai, which is also India's financial hub, had been the target of several terror attacks, the 2006 bombings were some of the deadliest. Seven coordinated explosions during evening rush hour in the first-class compartments of several trains wielded death and destruction in less than 15 minutes. Sentences are expected on Monday, where prosecutors will attempt to get the death penalty instated. Most of those found guilty were members of an outlawed Indian militant group, the Students' Islamic Movement of India, or SIMI. Authorities in India maintain that the blasts were planned by Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence and carried out by operatives of the Islamic militant group Lashkar-e-Tabiya with the help of Simi. Pakistan has denied any involvement in the blasts. Those involved with the investigation hope that these convictions finally bring about some closure to those who lost loved ones or were injured. Thousands of protesters, including opposition lawmakers, made a last-ditch effort Wednesday to block a vote on security bills that would expand Japan's military. It's a controversial policy, not only because of the direction it would take the country, but also for the manner in which Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has chosen to implement it. If you're unaware, the security bills would allow Japan's military to defend its allies even when Japan isn't under attack, and take on greater roles during international peacekeeping missions. Abe says Japan needs the bills to bolster its defenses amid China's growing assertiveness and to do its part in global security. Opponents claim the legislation violates Japan's war-renouncing constitution. The problem is that both sides are technically correct. Times have changed, and Japan needs to be able to engage in collective self-defense. The problem is that Abe is going about it wrong, and not a single independent constitutional lawyer believes the Prime Minister's actions pass muster. The bills, passed by the more powerful lower house in July, have since been debated in the upper house. The LDP and Coalition Komeito Party began discussions in the upper house on Wednesday with the intention of passing the bills into law by Friday ahead of a five-day holiday weekend. Katsuya Okada, 
head of the main opposition Democratic Party of Japan, said it was outrageous for Abe's ruling bloc to rush a vote on the legislation that has split the nation down the middle. During Thursday's session, things got a little heated in Parliament as opposition lawmakers physically pushed and shoved in an attempt to block the measure. It was a surreal scene and not something normally witnessed. That it occurred should provide context as to how strongly many feel in Japan about these bills. Usually, when you eat something, eventually you can count on it to pass through. Well, that wasn't the case for one jewel thief in Thailand. According to reports, a Chinese woman swapped out a 10 million baht diamond with some costume jewelry that amounts to about 278,000 US dollars. She then proceeded to swallow the gem and try and flee the country. When authorities caught up with her, they waited for things to pass naturally, even trying to give her a laxative to help speed things up. But nothing worked. So she was taken to a hospital to have it extracted. The alleged perpetrator in all this has now been remanded to the courts. And personally, I wouldn't want to go near that thing or touch it ever again. The memory of where it has been would forever taint it. Here we are once more at the end of the podcast as things start to wind down. But before I go, here are just a few of the comments that you sent in last week. First up, Mr. Song said this on Korean unification. I always thought North Korea needed China. I can't think of anything China gets from the North. Red White Dude added, I doubt China would let Korea unify. It undermines their influence. The only way I see unification happening is if North Korea implodes and events get ahead of China or that China has serious domestic instability that will distract it and or force it to pull back away from North Korea. Twitter user at Marka also commented on Korean unification. Yeah, but under two conditions. One, kick the U.S. out of Korea. And two, Chinese military bases in Seoul. Heather Lyons commented on one of the articles we shared on Facebook where a Korean man, age 66, punched a pregnant woman for sitting in the reserve section of a subway car. Heather said, Definitely not condoning the man's actions or violence in any sense. He was way out of line and should face the consequences accordingly. However, she was only 10 weeks pregnant. In my opinion, she really didn't have a valid claim to the seat, if that's the argument. Kenny Dunlap wrote this in response to farmed dogs being flown out of South Korea. If dogs are raised for meat like other meats, say pigs, lamb, cows, etc., I see no problem with dog meat. But when it comes to the beating of live dogs because the meat is supposed to taste better, that's a different story. I do feel Westerners telling Koreans and other cultures not to eat dog meat simply because they don't like the idea is hypocritical to say the least. Matthew Nolan added, I still have yet to meet a Korean that finds eating dog a hallowed tradition. I found people in China were way more sympathetic to it, even comparing it to processed foods like chicken nuggets in the cruelty and strange department. Well, my friends, I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone who took the time out to send in comments this past week. I truly do appreciate it. Now, if you have a thought or an opinion about one of the stories in this week's episode, I'd love to hear from you. So please write in or even record yourself and mail in that audio file. Hey, my friends, if you enjoyed this week's podcast, I hope you'll do me a favor and share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is free and easy to do. Just go to our website, asianewsweekly.net, and click on the subscribe tab. You can also subscribe in your favorite podcast application like iTunes or Stitcher. Now, if you want to keep up with more news from the region, be sure to follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, I'd love to hear from you. The email address to write to is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. My name is Steve Miller, and I'd like to thank you so much for listening this week. So until next time, be true to yourself and always be awesome. <laughs>